Technological Museum on campus, you should come and, and join us sometime. The museum's been closed because of COVID, but we're hoping to, to reopen in the next couple of months. So just stay posted and you can follow us on Facebook or, or, or Facebook or Instagram. If you will. Yeah, <laughs> mostly just Facebook. <laughs> okay, um, so let me see, let me go ahead and get started and share my, um, share my screen with you. All right. Um, so when Wendy first invited me to do this, it was actually um, like last last year, right? Now, um, so we're we're a little bit behind um, when I originally thought I'd be able to give this talk, um, but I'm excited to be able to to be joining you this month um, to help celebrate Earth Day uh, and to think about um, Earth Day and conservation and as Wendy pointed out and introduced me already, like I, I'm a earth scientist, I'm a paleontologist. And so you might be wondering like what a paleontologist um, would be talking about conservation, right? Um, but I'm gonna answer that question tonight, hopefully, um, and, and spend a little bit of time talking about things that we don't normally think about when we think about conservation. We don't normally think about, um, uh, about, how fossils or uh, sometimes what we call subfossils, so remains of organisms that are not quite old enough to be considered fossils, how they can help us to, um, to um, inform conservation efforts and help us to better understand the ecosystems that we're trying to protect. All right, so, um, and also as Wendy said, we've got a small group. So um, I just want to open it up to questions. Like if, if you have something that you wanna ask a question about, please just um, feel free to chime in um, or put the question into the chat. I'm probably not gonna be able to keep track of, of if there are any chats, but um, hopefully Wendy will be able to do that for us. Okay, all right. So as I mentioned before, I am a paleontologist. And when you hear the word paleontologist, this is probably like what you think of, right? In your mind, like people think about paleontologists like working on dinosaur bones and fossils and like kind of hanging out in dusty old museums. And it doesn't really seem like a very um, dynamic study, right? Like it doesn't feel like relevant or as though we're, we're working on stuff that matters right now today. Like, you might think about paleontology as being, you know, the study of things that died millions of years ago, or, you know, just collecting bones and fossils in a museum. And while it's fun and interesting, like it sometimes is, is hard to see the relevancy to the issues that we're facing today, um, especially with regard to conserving um, ecosystems and protecting animals that might, that might be facing extinction. But I'm here tonight to convince you otherwise, like to, to help you take another look, a new look at paleontology and, and understand that it's not just, um, you know, like studying old bones that we've got stuck away in some back museum room, that, that paleontology is a, a lot more um, dynamic than that. Like it's, it's a changing field. It's a field where we want to ask questions that are relevant um, to what's going on in, in our world today as we think about climate change and habitat change and species loss, these are things that um, paleontology can speak to. We've, we've seen these changes in the past um, and we have the tools to be able to study on, on a longer time scale changes that are happening in our environment today. All right, so just as a sort of a, a case, oh, sorry, I already just like answered that question. So I'll skip ahead. All right, so just as a case study, to give you a, a little bit of context, um, this is not directly a paleontology story, but I want you to sort of like understand why we need context and what, what taking a long time scale um, has to offer conservation. So for a case study, um, this is the Goliath grouper, um, which lives in the Caribbean and around the Florida Keys and in the Gulf of Mexico. And these are incredibly large fish um, with very, very long lifespans. Um, and in 19, the early 1990s, so around 91, 93, um, uh, Goliath groupers reached a, a critical point where they were put on, um, they were proposed to be put on the endangered species list. Their populations were crashing um, and, 
and all of a sudden people were like, oh, okay, you know, something we need to do something about the Goliath grouper. They shut down fishing of the grouper of the, of the Goliath grouper, and and then um, we're uh, carefully monitoring the population of Goliath grouper. Um, and as uh, populations bounced back after uh, fishing was shut down, um, people then started to clamor to be able to fish Goliath grouper again. So around um, the, the mid 2000s, so around 2006, there were some, some movements to t remove Goliath grouper from a uh, critically um, endangered uh, list so that, so that we, they could be fished again. And everyone was like, well, there's, there's recovery of the population. It seems to be, you know, like going back, you know, things look good. Um, but then there was this um, critical paper published in um, a journal called Endangered Species Research, where a researcher um, looked at historical photos of fish from the 1950s um, through 2007 um, and, and looked at how those, those photographs recorded changes in, fish, in the fish population through time. Um, and, and what you'll notice in this, in this photo here on the upper left hand corner um, from 1958 is that on a, a trophy fishing hunting afternoon, right? Like, so this is one of those boats where you pay to go trophy fishing, you're out for the afternoon, you're like catching some fish, drinking some beer, having a great time. Um, and, and on that afternoon in 1958, when this picture was taken, they caught, um, I don't know, what's it look like? Like one, two, three, six, seven, man-sized Goliath grouper, right? So there's guy and his gal and his kid, right? And, and I don't know exactly how tall he is, but I'm assuming sort of average height. And you can see right here that all of these fish are humongous, right? Huge Goliath grouper. Okay, and then fast forward to 2007. And I tell you what, like this is the same dock, the same boat, or maybe not the same boat, but the same sort of uh, it, it's the same company, right? Same time of year. Um, and this is the trophy fish that they came back with on that afternoon in 2007. And like there, you don't, you don't need any numbers, any statistics to tell you that that is a very, very different sort of trophy fishing afternoon, right? So we've got, you know, some maybe 11, 12 inch snapper, right? Like, and, and nothing, you know, I don't know, here's, here's a small reef shark, right? But nothing, not, nothing even compares, right? With the size of the fish that they were hauling out in, in 1958. And so what this paper did um, for the Goliath grouper fishery and, and thinking about Goliath grouper conservation was that it showed that even though, that um, even though they had seen an increase in the population size of Goliath grouper from 1990, to 2006. Obviously, the, the, the population was bouncing back after fishing restrictions were put on it. That that increase was nowhere near what it needed to be to go back to what we might call a natural um, population, right? It was nowhere, no, nowhere even close. Yes, there was recovery, but when you think of the actual baseline, like what the population should have looked like, how much grouper there should have been, it wasn't, it wasn't even close, right? Like not even a drop in the bucket. Um, and so this, this information, this context, this critical context for understanding what had happened to that species um, kept, kept the fishery closed and has kept the fishery closed since, um, although people keep on trying to get it reopened. Um, and, and the point of that story, and I, I like to use this story because it has really nice dramatic pictures. The point of that story is we don't know in many cases what a natural population looks like, because we've been living in this environment, in these environments that we live in, in the environments that we want to protect for hundreds of years, maybe thousands of years. And we've really only been paying attention and documenting changes for maybe the last 50. And that's only for things that we really, really care about. And many populations, many ecosystems, many species are undocumented. And we don't know what change, um, what change means how they've been impacted by humans. Um, and so that's where I make the case um, for, for paleontology. And specifically, I, um, I'm going to, to talk about, kind of focus on this gray area between things that are alive and things that are true fossils, meaning that they're older than 10,000 years old. Um, and looking at this, this area that we call the, the sub-fossil record. 
Right, so I'm gonna share with you three case studies that I've worked on um, throughout my, my career so far, um, where we look at the subfossil record to better understand ecosystem change through time. So we're gonna talk about um, coral reefs from Panama. We're gonna talk about uh, benthic uh, marine ecosystems right off, the coast, right off the southern coast of California. And then we're gonna talk about lake ecosystems in the Midwest from, from Wisconsin. Um, so let's let's go ahead and get started. So right now I'll, I'll start with we'll start with the corals. We'll start with um, the Caribbean. So that was the first project that I really started working on that helped me transition over from sort of more traditional paleontology to thinking about this sort of uh, conservation paleontology and thinking about about changes on a, a shorter time scale on a human time scale. Um, so just for some context, uh, coral reefs are are in critical condition, um, especially coral reefs in, and, and this is a worldwide phenomenon, but especially coral reefs in the Caribbean. Um, so just for example, um, in the Caribbean, we know and, and guess that in the past 30 years, um, over at least at least 50% of coral, live coral cover has been lost. Um, and it is quite likely that over the past hundred years, it's more like 75 to 80%, right? So a huge amount of coral, live coral cover has been lost in the Caribbean. Um, and over the past 30 years, we've lost 95% of some of the most critical um, reef building corals called Acropora. So they have a couple of different species. Um, they're seen here in this upper right hand corner. Um, and this is a stand of bleached Acropora, meaning that they are diseased um, and they are unlikely to survive this warm water event that, that causes the bleaching. All right, and we're also just seeing a general ecosystem shift from uh, reefs dominated by hard corals um, to reefs that are dominated by macroalgae. So basically like soft, squishy, seaweedy like algae. Um, and that's what causes the, the green color in, in, these, in this reef on, on the left hand side. So there's a lot of algae, there's not a lot of coral, um, and there's many reasons why this is happening, but it can be really difficult um, to, to figure out. Um, so just another, another photo to help you understand what's going on. So this is a picture from the same location um, in, um, called Cary's Fort Reef in the Florida Keys. And you can see that in the mid 1970s, there, this was a, a thriving um, live reef. Um, and in 2016, it was nothing. It was rubble, it was sand. Um, there was no more reef. Um, and that's happening systematically throughout the Caribbean is this loss of live coral. All right, but why it's happening is very difficult to understand. So there's many natural stressors. There's many stressors, um, some natural, some not so natural, um, and they all interact with each other. Um, so as far as human impacts, right, there's um, eutrophication, which means too many nutrients in the water, usually from, that's coming from land, from agriculture or from sewage um, systems. There's loss of important fish that clean the reef. Um, and there's climate change, which is causing the waters to become warmer. And all of these things are really bad for corals. They don't like these things and it makes them sick and it makes them weak and it makes it hard for them to survive any sort of perturbation like a hurricane or like a particularly warm summer. But as far as the question of coral reef conservation, um, it's, it's difficult to put a finger on one thing and say, this is what we need to stop or this, this is where we need to put the effort. Um, and that would really help conservationists, right? Because there's a lot to do um, and if you knew what you needed to fix and what you needed to concentrate on, that would be very helpful. And so um, the goal of this project really was to try to understand how reefs have changed um, in, in Panama. So we're, we, um, we're focusing on this um, sort of northwestern area of Panama um, called Bocas del Toro, um, where there are, uh, it, it's a lagoon with sort of reefs on the outside of the lagoon. Uh, mostly that we're that we're interested in looking at, um, and so we we started this project just by doing um, what we call like short cores. And essentially, um, what we did is we hammered these like big steel drum buckets 
into the, the sediment, the sand surrounding um, live reefs um, and excavated that at 20 centimeter increments. So we just like pull out the sand and pull out all the other stuff that was in there um, to try to just understand how things have changed through time. Um, and when we dated that, we, we basically just divided that, that big, all that pile of sand that we got out of those steel drums into a pre-1960 and post-1960 bins. Um, and we, um, we looked at two things. And so I just wanted to, to quickly acknowledge just my co-author on the work, Katie Kramer, who's at Arizona State now. Um, she is a, a coral uh, biologist and ecologist. Um, so we looked at, at two major groups. We looked at the corals, which um, Katie's holding a couple pieces here in this picture. And we also looked at the, at the bivalves because mollusks are, are my specialty, I guess, like what I focus on. And so we wanted to understand um, how these two groups of animals, both which live in coral reefs and both which can be sensitive to environmental changes, how they changed through time. What, what, what things look like pre-1960 and what things look like post-1960. And what we, um, what we found were a couple of things. Um, so just in general, we saw that there were changes, right? So the, the ecosystem was changing um, and actually indicated that it had been changing long before 1960. So we've got changes, um, but, but essentially really just a big changes in the ecosystem assemblage. So who's living in that environment, in that, um, in that coral reef before 1960 and after 1960. And specifically, we saw um, one big change in the coral, which is a change from this coral called Acropora cervicornis. So there were a lot of these pre-1960 and post-1960, they're lost and we see this, this change, this different coral. And you might think, well, who cares? Like a coral's coral, like does it really matter? Um, but it, it actually does, right? Because these, these two corals live in, have different lifestyles, right? So Acropora cervicornis is a slow growing coral. It requires really clear waters um, and it's one of the big major reef builders in the Caribbean. Agaricea teniofolia, the other one that we're seeing sort of creeping in and taking over after 1960 is generally considered a sort of like weedy taxa, right? It's not as particular about its environment. It grows a lot faster. Um, and, and so that shift, that change from one type of coral to another is telling us something about the environment. The water is not as clean and clear. Um, there's not as many like sort of big reef corals growing. Um, it has to grow faster. Um, all, all these things are changing. And we also saw, um, and this was particularly fun for me because I'm the bivalve person, I really like bivalves, is this, this change in um, actually a loss of this particular bivalve. We found a lot of it in the sediment that was older than 1960, and then it disappeared in the more recent, um, like the upper part of the core, the more recent part of the core. Um, and what's cool about this guy, um, is, so it's, it's called an oyster, um, a frond oyster, or a dendostria frons is its scientific name, but it um, just crashes, it's, its population just crashes. And the reason why this happened, um, at least that, that we think our best hypothesis, hypothesis is that this, this oyster has this really cool thing that it does is it grows these hooks, which you can kind of see in this like lower left corner. And it, I mean, by growing hooks, I just mean it, as it grows, its shell forms out around to hold on to things like uh, long sticks of coral, or like soft coral, um, sea fans or sea whips. And, um, and we, we thought this was really interesting to see because um, in, the, in the modern reef environment, there are no uh, soft corals. There's no sea fans, there's no sea whips. And so the loss of these guys who preferentially live on sea fans or sea whips, as you can see here in the upper, upper left, um, indicates that, that this, this is showing us that there's a loss of uh, an organism that we never would have known about because it doesn't leave a fossil record. It doesn't have a skeleton. Um, and so we're seeing that there's this, this huge change in the coral community in Panama in the Bocas del Toro region just since the 1960s. Loss of certain corals, loss of, of soft corals. And so we decided that we would investigate any uh, even more. So this, we went back to the same location and collected longer cores. Um, 
So we wanted to understand sort of a deeper history for, for this um, environment. And so you can see on the bottom um, what that core collection looks like. There's essentially like a big uh, vibrating kind of like motor um, that forces the aluminum tubing down into the sediment. And so we, what we end up were um, a couple of these longer cores. And so this is what one of these cores looks like um, when you cut it in half lengthwise. And so what you're seeing are four different halves of that core. Um, and we were able to date some of the pieces of coral. Um, so we know that the top of that core, sort of that, that part of the reef stopped forming in the 1980s. And our oldest date goes back to 1100 AD. So we have several hundred years of history of, of this, of this um, coral reef. And what we did is um, we looked back through time at a couple of specific organisms that we know can tell us something about the environment. Um, so we looked at corals, um, we looked at foraminifera, which are a tiny little um, type of plankton um, that can live in, in marine environments. Um, we looked at bivalves and we looked at, at sea urchins, right, because they're often important components of coral reefs as well. Um, and we did this, so we sort of just like looked at a couple of key species from each of these groups that can tell us something about the environment. Um, sorry, I'm going to put like a lot of stuff up on here. You don't really need to know all of these particulars, but really just understand that we looked at animals that we can tie directly to a certain environment, environmental condition, right? So we looked at corals that like high light and corals that like low light. Um, we looked at forams that indicate high water clarity versus forams that indicate low water clarity and bivalves that need hard substrate versus bivalves that live in the sand. And so we did this so that we, because we can't go back in a time machine, we can't see how the environment has changed. But by looking at these proxies, by understanding how these organisms are tied to their environment, we can reconstruct what the ecosystem was like back through time. And what we found is that um, throughout the past several hundred years, that there have been major changes in the ecosystems um, in these reefs, right? So, Parrotfish have, have disappeared. Um, we have seen changes in, in corals and certain corals have gone away. We've seen shifts in the type of bivalves and shifts in the type of sea urchins. And, and this really begins in the 1750s, which was long before we thought we would see any shift at all. But all of these shifts are pointing to one thing and they're in, indicating a change in water clarity. Um, so we're seeing after the 1750s, we're seeing things that grow in lower light, things that grow in higher nutrients. And, and this was surprising for us and really shocking for many other people in the, in the coral reef um, uh, field and, and actually something that we got a lot of, um, a lot of pushback on because, um, because we're, what we're suggesting is something that people weren't thinking, right? People, most people were thinking that coral reef ecosystems had changed since the 1960s, and most of it has changed due to pollution and, and climate change. Um, but what we showed was that these ecosystems were changing long before that, hundreds of years before anyone had even put their head in the water and thought about monitoring coral, um, coral reefs. Um, and, and, and so we, in, we, we see coral reef change, ecosystem change, changing far back into, into Caribbean history, um, long before the 20th century. And actually we can tie that to the advent of banana plantations in Panama. So um, uh, European colonizers came over, they thought, hey, won't it be great, we'll grow bananas here in Panama, we'll ship, it, ship them all over the world and make a lot of money. And, and what they did is they cleared massive parts of the, that area of Panama that we're looking at um, along the mainland close to Bocas del Toro. They cleared it um, and they put in banana plantations. And that land clearing led to high amounts of erosion, nutrients running into that lagoon um, where they hadn't before. Um, and so this is, this is a fundamentally changing the ecosystem and impacting coral reefs. And so humans have been doing this for hundreds of years, right? Not just the past 50. All right, um, so what does that mean for coral reef management? Um, it, it's actually, um, I like to take a positive spin on it. Like I think, that um that thinking i mean at first it seems really depressing you're like oh like we've been like killing these corals since seven seven seventeen hundreds like how are we like even going to come back from that 
Um, but I think it's actually a, a positive thing to, to know that land management um, can have such a, a major impact on coral reefs because some of the other things that can impact corals are so big that no local country, no local community can have an impact on them. Um, the reefs in Panama are, are going to experience climate change. That's happening. Panamanians can't do anything about it, right? But uh, local people, local communities can control how um, the, their land use. They can control what is happening to that land adjacent to coral reefs. Like that's something that they have a little bit more control of. It's something that can be um, changed and governed locally. Um, and so I, I think that that's positive that we understand that land use has such a big impact on the health of corals because that's something that we can do on a more, on a more local scale. All right, so I remain optimistic about understanding how land use changes impact coral reefs. Perhaps if we can make coral reefs a little bit healthier, if corals are healthier because they're living in clean, clear water, maybe then they'll be able to withstand other, other changes like uh, increasing temperatures um, due to climate change. All right. So I'm going to shift really quickly now and, and move on to a little story from Southern California. Um, where we're looking at the impact of high nutrients and sewage waste on benthic marine communities. And so I just mean like the clams that are living in the mud along the coast of Southern California. And just really quickly, I'd like to, um, this was an uh, effort on um, the research vessel, the Melville out of Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Um, and I had a huge scientific crew that I'd like to, you know, acknowledge really quickly including um, Susan Kidwell from the University of California and Clark Alexander from um, the University of Georgia who are collaborators on this work. All right, and so as you might know, um, Southern California has been plagued by um, sewage pollution and nutrient pollution of their coastal waters for, for decades. Um, LA sort of sprang out of nowhere really quickly and has always had infrastructure problems, um, especially with sort of controlling sewage and, and waste. Um, and for a long time, people were just like, just like, whatever, throw it in the ocean. The ocean's big, like, it'll be fine. Um, but it wasn't, right? The, the ocean became polluted and became dangerous. Um, and, and so, um, and, and this happened all along the, the Southern California coastline. So there's six major wastewater outfalls along the Southern California coast from um, San Diego, um, south, Southern San Diego up to Ventura. And these were places where we were just like dumping our sewage into the ocean and everyone was like, it's gonna be fine. Like, whatever, it's, it's okay. Like, we just wanna get it out of the city. Um, but it wasn't, um, and there's major problems. But thankfully in 1972, um, they, put, paced, uh, they um, passed the Clean Water Act, um, which required then these, these wastewater outfalls to start cleaning up all of the poop, right? Like that they were putting into the ocean. Um, so I'm particularly focusing on one area. Oh, let me go back real quick. Um, this is the a White Point outfall here, which we're gonna look at, which is in um, on the Palos Verdes um, Peninsula in Southern Los Angeles County. Um, and so this is sort of the history of wastewater outfall there. Um, so it opened in 1940s, right until the 1970s, we're just putting everything into the ocean, right? Everything, not treated at all. Like it comes out of your toilet, it goes into, into the ocean. Um, in 1970s, they began to, um, to do sort of like primary treatment, which is basically just removing suspended solids from that wastewater, um, which helped clean up the water a little bit. Um, and then in the 1980s, they began secondary treatment which means that there's treatment using microbes to reduce the amount of nutrients, um, especially nitrogen and phosphorus in the water. And so now the water that's coming out of the, the White Point outfall is pretty clean. Like, I wouldn't drink it, but like, it's pretty clean. Um, and, and so there's been this huge change in, in water quality on near the sewage outfall. And so we wanted to know like how that has impacted life living there. All right, so here is um, in this orange, whatever, this orange square, right? This is where the outfall is. So it has three pipes going out into the ocean where the wastewater is pushed into the ocean. Um, and I was actually sort of following up on some um, monitoring that has been done by uh, the Los Angeles County Sanitation District. It's been mandated since the 70s 
that they um, monitor uh, the, the ecosystems and how the wastewater is impacting the ecosystems. And so we wanted to use that data um, and then also collect uh, data from sediment cores that will give us a deeper history to understand how these communities have been impacted by all of this wastewater pollution. Right, so, so this is the data just from the, the living data collected by LA County Sanitation District. They go out every year, they take a scoop of mud and they see what's living in it. And what you can see, um, maybe, this is, these are kind of messy, but like what I want you to see is that in red are um, these guys. They're called Parvillacina tenia sculpta. They're a kind of clam that can live in like the most disgusting uh, things you can think of. So really low oxygen, really stinky, mucky water. They're totally happy. Um, and so in, during all of this like wastewater, nutrient pollution, all of this going on, they're totally happy. And they're basically the only things living there, right? So they're living there in hundreds and thousands of them are just blooming and, and thriving and having a great time. Um, but everything else is essentially flat. There's nothing else living there. Only a couple things now and then. Um, but then since sort of the 1980s, this, um, this population has changed, right? It's, it's shown there's fewer of these pollution tolerant guys and there's many other things starting to live in that area. All right, but, but we don't know what happened before, right? We don't know, like, is this good? Is this bad? Like, does this represent something natural? Um, and so what we did is we went out and we collected these cores. And so these pictures kind of show you a little bit about what I mean when I say we collected a core. So we dropped this like giant steel box <laughs> off the back of the ship. It's got like a shovel attachment on it. And so then it, it drops to the bottom, the shovel, the scoop closes, and then you pull up like a bunch of the stinky mud from the bottom of the ocean. Very pleasant, right? I know. Great. Um, and then we kind of use these plexiglass cores to subsample and you can, and then would sort of take off a couple of centimeters at a time. And, and what we ended up recovering, the amount of mud we're able to recover represents about a century's worth of, of mud accumulation at the bottom of the seafloor. And so we could say a little bit more than we could just by using the living data about how the communities have changed through time. All right, and so this is the data that comes from the core. Um, and, and one of the things that I want to just point out really quickly is that in red is the same guy. And we see that, um, that there's good temporal fidelity. Like we see around the 1960s, early 1970s, this peak in these guys that we expected to see giving the living data. Um, but it's not like it never reaches those huge numbers um, that that we saw in the living data. And so what, the first question we had to do, um, it was ask and wonder, well, well why? Why don't we see um, like all, all of this guy in the core? Like, why is there other things? Like, were they living there? Were they not? What's going on? Um, and, and the question is really answered by this, um, by thinking about something called time averaging. So I'm gonna give you a little ana analogy right now to help you understand time averaging. Um, so I, I have two kids at home. Um, so they're in this picture here at the top. And if I showed you this picture of my kids um, that you see at the top of the screen, like you might think that they always are very neat and tidy, wearing like button ups and little sweater vests, right? And but that's that's just a snapshot, right? Like that's one second in time when they're like actually not dribbling jelly or snot or you know like mud all over them, right? Like they actually look neat and tidy not like the situation all the time. Um, but you might get a, a better understanding of what's going on um, if you look at all of their clothes from like the past week, right? Like you'd see what they normally wear, right? Like torn sweatpants and t-shirts that have stains on them, right? Like things like that. Um, well, you guys are gonna think my kids are like total slops, but they, they are, right? They're like boys. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> okay, so, um, so, so that's the difference between a snapshot and, and what we would say is something that's time average that shows an accumulation over time. And so we get the same thing when we look at these death assemblages or subfossil assemblages. The living is essentially a snapshot, right? You go out, you collect a bucket of mud on a single moment of a single day and a single year, and you see what's alive right then. Um, and that's how, how you get this like really high resolution um, 
like a very clear picture of what's going on at that second in time. But when you collect the cores, you're seeing an accumulation or a time average assemblage of things that were living maybe not exactly at the same time, maybe things that lived in that area over a couple of years. And so it has a tendency to kind of like um, smooth out, right, any signal that you're seeing. Things get mixed up, other things fall in, it's not quite as clear. Um, so that's something that we have to understand is that we're looking at this sort of fuzzy picture when we're, when we're looking through the past and looking back into the course. But the fuzzy picture is okay, right? Because it's still showing us general trends. And so what can we learn um, from this, this fuzzy picture looking back into the past? And we can see a couple of things. So one is that we can compare the beginning of that core 100 years ago to the end of that core right now. And we can see that they're starting to look a little bit the same. So if we look at this old, you know, what was happening in 1900, what's happening in 2000s, and the fact that they are starting to look similar is, is a positive indication, right? It indicates to us that the community is starting to look the way it did before that wastewater outfall was put in in the 1940s, which is positive, right? It's good. Like, yay, sewage treatment is working. Who would have thought, right? And there's, but there's a couple of other things. So that's the positive thing that's telling us, but there's a couple of other things that it's indicating us, to us as well. So one of the reasons um, that we get this, this time average, this fuzziness, is that we're mixing into that subfossil assemblage other shells that were living hundreds of years ago or thousands of years ago and that, that get kicked up. And so we did a little bit of dating of individuals um, and found that um, many of them are centuries to millennia old. And the other thing that's interesting is that some of the shells that we're getting in our core are, are basically functional, functionally extinct. So they're not extinct everywhere in the world, but along the Southern California coast, you can no longer find them. Um, because the ecosystem has changed, it's become muddy, it's, it's not as sandy as it was before. Um, and so this is, this is the negative thing that we learn, right? We learn that, yay, sewage treatment is working, the population and, and ecology seems to be returning to what it was before, but at the same time, we've lost some species and are unlikely for, it's unlikely for them to return because the ecosystem has fundamentally changed. Um, so those are, that's our story for, um, for Southern California. And I'm actually um, looking at the time and I wanna make sure that I'm leaving plenty of time for questions. Um, so I'm gonna go through like the next little part kind of quick. <laughs> so, um, because I, I just could talk forever about this. I'm sorry, guys. All right, so the, the next thing that we did, this is a project um, that was sponsored through the CAC Learning Consortium, which is um, uh, sponsored by NSF. And so there were several undergraduate workers um, and some colleagues of mine who were interested in coring lakes to understand how lake ecosystems have been impacted by humans. And particularly um, the data from this uh, that I'm gonna show today comes from one lake called Shadow Lake, which is in Wapaka County, um, Wisconsin. Um, and we were interested in understanding how this lake had changed because it had been remediated, right? It's been treated um, and, and, and the community there is trying to return it to its natural ecosystem state. So we went out and we collect a couple of cores, which involves like pushing rods down into the sediment, and pulling them back up, um, students had a lot of fun, like this is what a core looks like here on the right. I'm um, going, cutting the cores, picking the cores, describing the cores, pulling out samples of the cores. Um, and essentially, I'm going to go through this quick. I'm sorry, guys. What we did, we, we dated the cores so we understand how old um, they are, how much uh, sediment accumulates each year. Um, so we can put a time on, on this mud, right? The mud has a time scale. Um, and then I'm just going to present um, some of the work that one of the students did working on using diatoms to reconstruct ecosystem. And diatoms are these tiny little planktonic um, algae. They photosynthesize. Um, they, have e they have certain environmental tolerances. And they have a silica or an opaline shell. So it gets preserved in the mud really easily. And so what she did is she looked at several of these um, through a core from Shadow Lake and found that there are sort of like groups of, of diatoms um, that you see in different parts of the core, right? So this bottom part of the core before 1840 is our pre-impact 
core, right? So this is before Europeans had come to settle Wisconsin. It's probably a pretty natural, um, natural part of the core where we're seeing natural climatic variation. Um, and there are some um, diatoms that are, are um, characteristic of that, right? So these are diatoms that live in like a, a low, relatively low nutrient environment, relatively clear waters. Um, but then we see some changes um, where we're, we're post impact, people are starting to live there, people are starting to clear land. And then we see a change in the type of diatoms, right? So this sky becomes um, abundant. And then we get to this, this period where we sort of reach an ecological threshold. Things get really, really nutrient rich in the lake. Um, and, and we have sort of like a, a very, very small abundance of a certain diatom that lives in these very um, high nutrient conditions. And then there's treatment, right? So then in the 1970s, um, they, they begin to treat the lake, they begin to remediate the lake, try to reduce the amount of, of nutrients. And we see that then there's another group of, of diatoms um, that, um, th that comes into play, right? And they are representing a, a, a time or a, an environment where there's less nutrients. And, and although it's not sort of like the same things that we saw here at the base of the core, it's a suggestion of, of an ecosystem moving back towards more, more natural um, environmental conditions. So we were able to communicate with some of the local community organizations that, hey, two thumbs up, you guys are doing a good job, what you're doing is working. Um, so sorry, quick. Okay, and then I just wanted to preview like this really new project that I've just started to work on. So we don't have many results, but I wanted to tell you about it and maybe I can come and tell you more about it someday when it's done, <laughs> right? So this is working in, in Maharashtra um, province in India, which is a semi-arid part of India that is less like the Jungle Book and more like the American Southwest. So it has a semi-arid climate. There's lots of these mesas in the background. And it's also a very agricultural um, center. It's, it's a huge agricultural, um, agriculture is their main economic output, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, so, so agriculture in this region is done on, on several different scales, depending on um, how affluent the farmers are, right? So there are people who, um, who use uh, mechanized tractors and things like that, and there are people who don't. Um, farming is, many times done by small holds farmers um, where their whole family will work on on a couple of plots um, and that will sustain their family um, and then there's other farmers right who have who have begun to transition to uh, and, and are replacing sort of traditional crops like millet which are are drought resistant with uh, cash crops that require more water and actually i, I say they're they're starting to choose but it actually began with um, British colonization, like these cash crops began, um, and then some farmers have chosen to continue to try to grow these cash crops, including cotton, including onions, and including pomegranates, right? So we've got, we've got a lot of, it's a, it's a place where there's a lot of conflict, right? So there's conflict between farmers of different, um, different class, and in India, different caste, um, and also farmers, conflict between farmers who are doing more traditional farming, and, and cash crops. Um, and so there's a lot of stress on, on water in this region and a lot of unequal access to water in the region. And so um, what, what we're trying to address is the, the potential for climate change to really have a, a huge impact on these farmers who rely almost like, they rely on the mon monsoon to come um, and, and they count on the monsoon for their crops. Um, and one of the predictions um, that we see for climate change in this area is that in India, in general, that there's going to be huge uh, differences in the amount of rainfall. So coastal regions like Mumbai will probably experience more rainfall, more heavy flooding. But interior regions like Maharashtra and the in interior peninsula are probably likely to experience more drought. Um, and that's likely to occur as monsoons become more erratic um, and come later in the year. And so these farmers are probably going to be heavily impacted by this um, because especially when we talk about farmers who are, are poorer, who don't have as many as much mechanized um, equipment, they don't have irrigation, right? They are relying solely on, on rainfall. All right, and so 
what we're doing is we're, we're going out to some of these lakes in the semi-arid region and collecting sediment cores from the lakes. So um, here are some pictures from, from when I was able to go a couple of years ago, right? So this is like me holding this core on for dear life because it took us all day to get one core. <laughs> so we've got a couple of sediment cores from some of these lakes um, that we're starting to work up sort of initial data right now. And here, this is another example of of one of those lakes and actually we, we showed up to to drill the lake with like a boat and stuff and the lake had been completely drained so they had completely drained the the lake for for um, irrigation um, and of course only the rich farmers right like had access to that drained um, lake water right so what we're doing is we have this whole team um, of of scientists and social scientists and um, we even have like a, a filmmaker which is like pretty fun um, we have an economist and social scientists who study this. And so, so what we're trying to do is really build like a very collaborative, integrative project where we work with local communities to understand their needs and concerns over climate and um, water resources, where we um, try to look at the course to better understand a record of climate change and ecosystem change and, and health of the, of the water um, the ecosystems, the lake e ecosystems through time to try to really uh, get a holistic view of how uh, of the health of these ecosystems with the, the hope that we'll be able to impact local policy that will be able to help local communities um, answer questions about their their water resources. Um, so really excited about that and I hope you guys stay tuned. Um, so anyway, I want to thank you for this opportunity to speak with you tonight. Um, and I will just uh, briefly acknowledge like all the many collaborators and funding for this project and I will take any questions that you have. Sorry, I felt like I went really fast there at the end. So if anyone has questions, let me know. Feel free to unmute and just ask away too. Don't Do you know of comparable work that's done internationally? Um, comparable in, in what way? Sorry. Like that they can um, find the same, the same events and calibrate things in the same way and look at lake court. Yeah. Um, yeah. So certainly like major events can be seen um, over, over larger regions. Um, but it, 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 as it so happens, it tends that the cores collected in lakes are more um, more impacted by regional or local events. So it's possible that, um, and what actually what we're hoping to do is when we collect more cores from lakes all across uh, Maharashtra. So we actually have a field, um, we had a field season planned last summer, which didn't happen because of uh, coronavirus. And I'm hoping to be able to get back in December. Um, but we have we have a transect of lakes that go from sort of the the hills outside Mumbai across across the peninsula. And um, yeah, I hope that we'll be able to to look at all of them and see if they record similar events or if they're most mostly recording like so they should record the same sort of large monsoonal events. Um, but but it's also like it's also possible that they could be mostly impacted by more regional events. And that's something that we have to have to look at have to look at. Um, but on a, on a more broader context, like, yes, it is possible if you have like a large enough event um, that, that, that you could see that event in multiple cores from multiple locations. It just depends on the scale. I hope that answered your question, Jessica. Yeah, very much. Thank you. Um, how would like different latitudes like affect the different formations of corals, like what they were fossilized in other than like Lagerstatten's? Okay, yeah, so so that's a good question. So, um, so corals are actually, um, they're, they're pretty restricted to the tropics. So, um, yeah, you don't get a lot of corals growing outside of the tropics. And so what that means is that Corals are really good um, indicators of past tropical conditions. So when we find corals in the fossil record, um, and corals are normally preserved in limestones, which we have a lot of here in Ohio. Um, and and when, so when we find fossils preserved in limestones or, or other carbonate rocks, 
we can tell that those rocks were deposited in a tropical location when they were formed. So what's cool about that is you can go around and you can look, um, anyone who's out like fossil hunting here in Ohio, I mean, it's really common to find corals in Ohio um, in these sort of like Ordovician, Devonian aged limestones. And so one, one cool thing that we can use corals for is understanding that during that time period, Ohio was located in, in, a, tropical, um, in a tropical environment. Did that answer your question, Alina? Yeah, thank you. Are you seeing, do, or do you know offhand uh, with the coral reefs, are you seeing that happen, the water clarity being issues other ways? Like I know we, the first, um, I think the first scene was from the Keys in Florida. Yeah. And I, I can't imagine the Keys are agricultural, um, but I could totally be mistaken. Yeah. But is that, um, um, is it a water clarity issue or? Yeah, so a lot of times, um, I think, and so, so we have plans to expand the study up um, into uh, the Bahamas and, and hopefully into the Keys. Um, we want to better understand, sort of like have more evidence for this, but just sort of like being on coral reefs and looking at water clarity, it, it, it hands down has to be an issue. And especially in places like the Keys, it, it doesn't, like you said, like it's not an agricultural region. But water quality isn't isn't just impacted by um, by agriculture. Like agriculture is the main reason. But any time that you're clearing land, right. um, that you're you're putting up buildings, right? Like anything that causes increased erosion can cause more of that sediment to enter the water column um, and cause water clarity issues. In addition, um, adding any sort of nutrients can cause water clarity, right? Because you can get blooms of algae and blooms of plankton that decrease water clarity. And that can happen um, as you put agricultural uh, fertilizers into the water, but also as you put in other fertilizers that can come from sewage or, or other, um, other you know, uh, right, like lawns, right? Like golf courses, right? So all of right. these things can, can put more fertilizers into the water. So yeah, so all these things that we find in Florida, lots of building, golf courses, stuff like that, those are really, really bad for coral reefs. How far up Florida do they, I mean, where is kind of, do you know where the cutoff is essentially where coral reefs kind of stop? I know you said tropical latitudes and I just. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, like there, you don't really find uh, corals uh, much further north. Yeah, like you, you don't really find them much further north in Miami. So it's mostly, okay. mostly in the okay. Keys. Yeah. Not that, not that it makes the rest of that stuff okay. I just yeah no yeah but yeah you're right like you're you're absolutely right like Florida is really sort of on the edge um, mm -hmm. and actually like one thing that that we think about is when we talk about about climate change like one one I don't know hope I guess that people have is that corals just start progressively moving further north like maybe they can start to grow outside of the tropics and that might be one way that corals survive because the tropics are becoming becoming too warm um so so we might begin to see and i think actually some people have begun to document uh, range expansion in some coral species if they move a little bit further north well we'll see yeah um, back when like Pangaea and Rodinia were like still supercontinents, mm -hmm. would like could it have been possible that corals would have like formed all around like around Panthesla? Yeah. Um. So so Pangaea. So you want to remember that Pangaea was like a huge continent. So um, it it extended all the way down to almost the South Pole. Um, and extended all the way up into like really high high latitudes in the north as well. But yeah, so the area around, so the tropical areas around the margins of Pangaea um, had, had coral reef. Um, and actually, um, sort of like during the end of Pangaea, like they actually like grew these weird reefs. There are these reefs called rudest reefs, which had these huge bivalves that would grow in them. So, so yeah, so reefs, reefs have always been on earth since um, since like almost the Cambrian, so like the Ordovician, right? Like we've had tons and tons of reefs on on Earth. It would be really sad if we made them go extinct now, like because they've been here for 500 million years. Right. Um, 
Um, when you mentioned that uh, land management and agriculture have uh, an effect on the coral reef and their uh, destruction, um, I thought this was really interesting because I always thought it was, uh, there, for example, the bleaching of the corals were due to the, the warming of the water. So I thought that was interesting. But um, how much of an impact if we decide to like manage the land properly or stop, you know, clear cutting uh, on the coast? It seems that this is going to be just a, a tiny, tiny piece of the puzzle uh, in their, you know, recovery. Um, so I, I just wonder if you know like how much of an impact really it can have when we still have global global warming. Yeah, I mean that that's that's an excellent question. Thanks for bringing that up. And and the answer is that we we don't know, right? As you as you mentioned before, um, their bleaching events are caused by by global warming, um, and there's problems due to to pollutants going into the water, and there's lack of of fish that are needed to, to clear and clean the reef. So there's, like you, like you said, there, there are all these problems. Um, and, and the problem is that sometimes these problems can be paralyzing and there's other, th there's other problems that we can't do anything about. Like at, at this point in time, um, unless something dramatic happens at, on the worldwide stage as far as climate change, like we are committed right now to warming climates. We are committed to seeing many, many warmer summers and much, much warmer waters. Um, like it, it's happening and it's happening now. And so I guess um, it, it's possible that, okay, so, so we, don't, we don't know, um, but, but the thing is we don't know how much each of these components impacts the coral reefs. Like we just, it's an unknown thing. Um, and so I guess what I'm suggesting is I'm, I'm not suggesting that climate change doesn't have an impact on reefs. We know it does. And we know that that those warm waters causes bleaching. I guess what I'm saying is that we don't know how how much it could help the reefs if they have a healthy starting point. Like, will it make them more resistant? Will it make them more resilient? And, and in places where there are um, healthier waters, um, it does seem that there are some corals that are, are more resilient to bleaching. So for example, this is a very, very limited antidote um, and I don't know if it's good for everywhere and people just have, we, don't, we just don't know because we haven't done it. But in um, Virgin Islands National Park, where the waters are pretty clean, where it's protected and where there's not much land use, they have found um, patches of corals that seem to be resistant to bleaching. And now whether or not that's a genetic anomaly or whether or not that's because those those corals happen to be healthy and happen to be able to survive like and, and they're not they don't have all these other stressors um we don't know yet like this is this is something that we just don't know but i would like to see us try right like i'd like to see um i'd, I'd like to see there be a little bit more um focus on things that people on uh, things things that local people can do local things um, because at this point in time it feels like climate change is is a little bit too far gone um, and so if we can if we can focus on other bits that we have a little bit more control on to help make coral reefs healthier i think that that might that might be the best way to go right now but i i don't know like sometimes it seems just a little a little too depressing <laughs> Yes, and I I really enjoy this uh, this part and your your response because it brings a little hope that maybe there are things that maybe yeah. things that we think is small but that actually can have an impact. We just don't know yet, so yeah. it sort of bring some some hope into the whole uh, doom scenario. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. Right, without hope, it's just like you throw up your hands and you can't do anything. But I think there are avenues that we can still explore, and and maybe we can have some luck. Other questions? Okay, well, I want to say thank you for coming. This was a really great talk. I thought I learned a ton. I, I love everyone's questions. I do feel a little bit of hope. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, hope. We want yeah. to have hope. Yeah. Um, 
and uh, we would love to have you come back and tell us about your study in India and how that how that turns out and just give us an update on yeah, absolutely. what's happening in the oceans so if anyone has any last minute questions otherwise we really appreciate everyone coming and um, we hope you found this interesting we will be posting this and um, if you check on our uh, Granville Public Library YouTube channel and we'll share it with uh, Dr. Leonard Pinkle so she can share it through her her groups um, and if you haven't checked out the Orton Museum check it out it's a, a good a good afternoon of fun if you're into fossils and um, I don't any other closing remarks no, thank you everyone for, for coming. I, thanks for inviting me, Wendy. I had a lot of fun. Well, good. We really appreciate it. This is a great talk. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.